Hi and welcome to Warrigal Anglican Church. My name is Tracy Lowers and the minister of this parish and it's my great privilege to welcome you to our service today. From wherever you're watching this service, the land upon which you sit or stand has a history, has a place in God's story and was cared for by people before your time. Here in Warrigal, in regional Victoria, these lands traditionally were cared for by the Gunai Kurnai people, and today we pay our respects to their elders, past and present. Ours is an Anglican church, and the service, the prayer book service that we're going inside to have together is a formal and reverent service, and the prayers for the service will come up on the screen as we make our way through the service. We record our Bible readings and our sermon and our songs at different points, so you might notice a change of scene when we get to those points. If you're watching the service, you're probably in lockdown somewhere in the world as we work together to beat this COVID-19 virus. May God bless you and your community and all of those frontline workers that are keeping us all safe. May God get us through this pandemic and may the quiet times that we spend at home out of necessity for our safety be also times in which we can draw nearer to God. May God nourish our spirits and strengthen our love for him and the world. Well, let's go in and have this service. <laughs> Friends, as we start our service, let me share to share a verse of scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 31. Be strong and courageous. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. What an encouragement. Sometimes when we look ahead to the future, we see problems or we see uncertainties. But here in this promise of scripture, of course, just one of the thousands in scripture, we see a great promise that God will be there ahead of us. 
that we have all of God's attention. God knows what is ahead of you and how to bring you through it intact. God will not fail or forsake you. So let's use this short time together to give thanks to Father, Son and Holy Spirit for all that they are to us and to renew our faith in their promises, to listen to them as we hear the scriptures read, as we hear the sermon, as we sing together and as we pray together. Friends, let's pray a prayer of thanksgiving as we start our service. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, for leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer together and uh, we're going to pray a prayer which is structured around Psalm 107 and during the prayer there'll be times when you can bring your own personal thanksgiving to the Lord. Lord we give you thanks for you are good and your loving mercy is forever. Lord you've redeemed us us here today and millions more from the furthest east to the furthest west in this vast world. Each of us has a story of your redemption and your love that has seen us lifted from a life less lived to your right paths that lead us to your heavenly presence. We thank you for your goodness and for all you do for us. You come to us in prayer. You meet us at our need. You are near to us at all times. Holy Spirit, we thank you for bringing to our minds those promises of God that we need to hear at just the right moment. Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for walking with us, leading us into the light of Christ. We each remember moments this week and are grateful for your providence and care and sometimes your direct intervention into a problem we had. Lord Jesus Christ, bringer of grace, bringer of salvation, bringer of peace, Son of God, we worship you, we praise you. Our ordinary lives have been made extraordinary by your love. Come to us now as we gather at your foot, the foot of your throne. Be with us, speak to us, minister to our needs and refresh our hearts. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today, or tomorrow, whenever it is that you're connecting in with the service. Our Bible readings today, uh, we've got two Bible readings, and the first one, the Old Testament one, is from Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Our second reading is from the book of Romans, and it's Romans chapter 1, um, verse 18 to 23 and then uh, 28 
to 32. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Weighty words for the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The mess we're all in. I did something a few days ago that I must say I've never done before. I turned off the TV in the middle of a news uh, segment. Uh, my wife, Lynn, who was sitting there, concurred with me because it was just so depressing. I don't have to tell you what the news was about. It was probably 20 minutes first of COVID and COVID figures and so on. But then we got into Afghanistan and the, the, the mess there. And so we turned the TV off. And we sat there sort of muttering to each other, what a mess, what a mess which strangely led us to, to then say, well, there was, wasn't there a series of ch children's books called What a Mess? And we, when we look back on the computer, we remembered reading them to our children. What a Mess was in fact a dog who made a mess of everything he got involved with. And strangely enough, that dog's breed was an Afghan hound. And we thought, ah. <laughs> so, we may well ask, are we in a bigger mess now than in previous years or generations? We currently sort of aren't at war with any particular people. There's always skirmishes all over the world. And I, sus and I suspect that very few of us of uh, my generation or younger have actually been fought in a war. I just missed out on being called up for Vietnam. I was one month too old. I was pleased about that. But my father fought in the Second World War. His father fought in the First World War. His father fought in the Boer War. His father fought in the Troubles and the Opium Wars, etc., in China. And if we go back to the 1900s and the 1800s and even further, there'd be very few generations who missed out, who avoided wars. This COVID virus has been shattering, of course, to our health, our mental health and our economy. But we've had worse pandemics or plagues. And if you look back over those plagues that we've had before vaccines were invented, some countries had 30% uh, death numbers, even up to 50%. The great plague of what, the 1600s, they say that about a third of Europe died. So perhaps 
We should be congratulating ourselves that we live in the 21st century. Fortunately, some things do change. Some quickly, some more slowly. But perhaps we are living richer, safer, hopefully happier lives. We certainly live in a material age. Looking back to my childhood, in the early 1950s, the only thing in our house that you had to plug in was a radio, there was nothing else. And radios then were about the size of a medium-sized refrigerator. There was no fridge or phone, no television, no bath. It was such a thrill, I remember, when we got an electric jug. That was the first electric appliance that we had. Now our houses are over-brimming with them. And are we happier? I came across these lines recently, and there's a lot you can read into them. A guy said on progress, and he said, my grandparents had a farm. My parents had a garden. I've got a can opener. When God told Abraham if he could find as few as ten righteous people in the city, God would spare Sodom and Gomorrah from judgment. A righteous minority could save a nation. That righteous minority, who by definition should be without sin, as far as that's possible for us weak mortals. One thing that hasn't changed much as we as we see recorded in our Bible, is the weakness, the rebelliousness, the often even lives, lives of the people then and today. How much do these words of Isaiah resonate? Written nearly 2,700 years ago. In chapter 5 he writes, You are doomed. You call evil good and call good evil. You turn darkness into light, and light into darkness. You make what is bitter sweet, and what is sweet you make bitter. You are doomed. You think you are so wise, so very clever. Heroes, I love this line, heroes of the wine bottle, brave and fearless when it comes to mixing drinks. And that was written 2,700 years ago, so... Have we changed an awful lot? There's another quote I love. It goes back 2,400 years. I won't go through it, but it's about what we all say these days, all we adults, we have things to say about the younger generation, don't we? The Greek philosopher Plato said 2,400 years ago, that's 96 generations ago, the same sort of things that we're saying these days about, about our youth. We certainly are in a mess at the moment, but can we find ten righteous people to save our society? Those who through the grace of God will try to live a sinless life. When we look at the thrust of our reading today from St Paul, we're reminded that Something which hasn't changed, not since the time he wrote his letter 2,000 years ago. Sin has not changed. It's as big and bold and nasty as ever. And when we get to verse 29, where Paul lists the sins of those who've rejected God, I know almost all of us will identify in some way. Not necessarily with ourselves, but with those we know that relates to most of these sins as listed. My NIV study Bible had a very good definition, I thought, of sin. It says, sin means refusing to do God's will and failing to do all God wants. Since Adam's rebellion against God, our, na our, our nature is to disobey him. Our sin cuts us off from God. Sin causes us to want to live our own way rather than God's way. Because God is perfect, just and fair, he's right to condemn sin. Each person has sinned, 
either by rebelling against God or by ignoring his will. No matter what our background or how hard we try to live good and moral lives, we cannot earn salvation or remove our sin. Only Christ can save us. And that's the end of that quote. I think it's interesting to note that Paul was uh, writing this letter to the believers in Rome, and that was before he'd ever visited there. He didn't know these people at all. In fact, none of the apostles had been to Rome either at that point. The church had been established there, it's thought, by some Jews who'd come to faith during the Pentecost time and had returned to Rome inspired and that was where they lived. And yet Paul lands on them, warns them against being tempted by that long list of sins in this chapter. Of course, Paul knew that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and he was encouraging them to arm themselves against these, these temptations. So let's study more closely the verses and I acknowledge here material I found from the writings of Thomas Snope, an American pastor. In verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. People suppress the truth about God. The Bible makes no attempt to prove there is a God. As we'll read later, it's self-evident. Also, people need to realise that his wrath is kindled against all who, one, deny him, two, ignore him, and three, resist him. Let's just remind ourselves of verse 17, which was in last, uh, last week's study. It says, For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who was put right with God through faith shall live. There's a huge contrast between that verse 17 and our verse, uh, the first verse this week, verse 18. In verse 17, we found brilliant light. In verse 18, there's awful darkness. Verse 17 is all light. Those who believe partake in the experience of the righteousness of God. Their future is bright and secure. In contrast, those who do not believe are guilty of ungodliness and unrighteousness and they will feel the wrath of God. They walk in darkness with their future bleak indeed, black indeed, bleak and black. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clear for all to see. The things he has made, the world, the stars, nature, animals, the forest, the skies, they were aware of his eternal powers. They were aware of God, but they did not worship him all were thankful to him, and their hearts were darkened. Paul then moves on to show how mankind's refusal to know God sees it fall into gross sin. First, <coughs> manifested by their turning to idols and the inevitable consequences. Without God in their lives, it left a God-shaped void in, in mankind's lives, and so they sought an alternative to fill that void. Graven images. Idolatry begins when people reject God. Instead of seeing him as the creator and sustainer of life, they see themselves as the centre of the universe. Then they invent gods, that are convenient project projections of their own selfish plans and decrees. These gods may be carved wooden figures, but they can also be goals or things we pursue 
such as money, power, or comforts. The common denominator is that idolaters worship things, things that God has made, rather than God himself. Then Paul clearly portrays the inevitable downward spiral into sin. First people reject God, Next, they make up their own ideas of what God should be or do, and then they fall into sin. You will note chillingly the statement that God gave them up. Or in uh, uh, one Bible, it, it says God gave them over. So it's clear that if you play around mocking the one who holds our very breath in his control you are potentially in danger that he will no longer acknowledge you. For you, it could be over. The emphasis of these verses is on the fact that judgment inevitably follows. And so, onto that terrible list that a depraved mind, mind will immerse itself into. We won't read it again now. Read it later, if you will. It's not good bedtime reading exactly. One commentator I read said that many times we read that list and take for granted that we know what it all means. But do you, do we get the full impact? He then went on to line up each sin with its original common Greek word, and explained its full meaning. Makes awful reading. We won't attempt to go through them all, but I've chosen just one to give you an idea of what he claims. And that sin is the word malicious or malice. In Greek, it's kakia, K-A-K-I-A. That's the common Greek word for general badness. It describes the case of a man who is destitute of every quality which would make him good. And it has in mind the, de the degeneracy out of which all sins grow and in which all sins flourish. A perusal of this list with its full Greek meanings, as I said, is not recommended bedtime reading exactly, but it may bring home to us sins which each one of us is guilty of to at least some extent. A, fernal, a further final warning from Paul that if we know of someone who does such things and we don't warn them off it, then we could be considered guilty as well. This is not an exactly uplifting part of Paul's letter to the Romans, but one we must confront, of course, and we know that through Jesus Christ our Lord we are guaranteed access to our God and able to say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us, for allowing us through prayer and worship to draw closer to you and to better resist the temptation of the devil. Let's have a closing prayer. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past, from a mess that we're all in, that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image, through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Please join with me in affirming what it is that we believe. We believe in one God who made and loves all that is. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was born, lived, died and rose again, and is coming to call all to account. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who calls, equips and sends out God's people 
and brings all things to their true end. This is our faith, the faith of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The scriptures encourage us, even if it has been a long time since we've sought for God, to return to the Lord. God is described as gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love in Joel chapter 2, verse 13. The scriptures encourage us to be frank with God about how our lives have gone this past week, the good as well as the bad, including our own personal failures if there have been any. And they encourage us to bring our needs before God. Our Heavenly Father wants to know what we need and the needs of others that we want to bring to the Father's attention. In this service, we use the Lord's Prayer, sometimes called the Our Father Prayer, to shape our prayers. And we're going to do that today. Please join with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you as our very best Father, the one on whom all other fathers are modelled, the one who is interested in our affairs, acts in our best interests, cares, loves, forgives, rejoices in us. And we acknowledge that you're not just our Father, but the Father of many. We bring before you some of our spiritual brothers and sisters who are in need of your help at this time. Hallowed be your name. From all eternity and to all eternity, you are holy. We don't take your name in vain, but we declare it in praise and awe. Shepherd of our souls, waymaker, the one who leads us to green pastures, to a state of overflowing, we pray that your worth would be seen and known and understood by all in our world, for you are the best thing that can come into each of our lives. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, at times we are too preoccupied with our own small lives, lives which your word says blossom and then fade and blow away. But your kingdom is forever and your ways are better. In sending Christ to us, your kingdom of peace broke into our lives. May it break in even further, especially into those dark spots that we try to keep hidden from all. May your kingdom break into the dark spots of our world too, and may you work through us, your people, to bring your heavenly ways to our world, which is often going forward in darkness. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, you invite us to bring our needs to you, practical needs, perhaps not needs for bread, but for other things, needs for jobs, for homes, for families, for health, both physical and our mental health, for inner and outer peace, for relationships to be fixed up, for work to progress, for our friends and for our children to thrive, for good government, for dealing with whatever crisis our pandemic and lockdowns and restrictions are causing us. Let's each take a moment to bring before you now our particular needs at this time. And Lord, we bring before you the needs of others. Some in our world do need bread today. Some need other things. Some need political asylum. Some need safety in their homes. Some need a better government. Some need safety from war. Some need access to the COVID vaccines. Let's each take a moment to name others who need your attention and care right now. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, you've loved us with an everlasting love. But instead of returning that love, we confess that there are weeks and months and years that fall short of your good standards and your ways and your laws. We confess that we've left undone the things we ought to have done. We're sorry we turn away from our sin. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us and help us to find it in our hearts to forgive others too. Perhaps a friend that has failed us or a colleague at work that is set against us or a mum or dad that has let us down. 
or an employer or debtor that hasn't paid us. We may have more work to do with those matters, we may still seek justice, but we take a moment now to name the situation and to enlarge our hearts to not hold these offences against our attitude to them. We are frail and broken and unworthy at times and can relate to failure and we seek their best. Help us to mend those situations and let us each take a moment to name that situation and person. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Father, we acknowledge the dark spots and corners of our lives, our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, our temptations, our unhealthy addictions and anger and other flaws that are entrenched that we find hard to overcome. Give us the strength and courage and friends and wisdom we need to overcome these. And yours is the power. Bring that power into our lives this week. May your spirit walk beside us. May your son lead our lives and hearts this week. And may we be servants of the King who was and is and is to come. Amen. Well, I wonder what you take away from this week's service. Did God speak to you in some part of the service? Did you learn or appreciate something fresh about God, something about yourself or the world? What will you take into the week ahead? We read in 2 Timothy 3.16 these words, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that we'll be equipped for the good works that God has for us to do. If you've got questions about anything in this service or any of our other services, or if we can pray for you or help you, or if you'd like us, or if you'd like to tell us what you thought about anything in the service, please go to our website. On the home page, you'll see a form, a way to get in touch with us. Well, let's close our service with this prayer. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, for feeding us with your word, and for encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.